Well, church, it is my privilege this morning to you to introduce Mr. Justin Peters. He has come from Idaho to preach to us this morning. Uh, but don't worry, he is originally from Mississippi, and so uh, he is uh, from the South like us. Uh, but he has ministry really going around our nation and the world, uh, sharing the gospel specifically as it relates to God's love for his people in the midst of sickness, in the midst of heartache, in the midst of crisis, and all that comes with living in a fallen world. And as Justin shares from God's word this morning, uh, I have shared with him some, how so many in our church have wrestled and struggled with uh, cancer, have uh, lost a loved one. Uh, like so many uh, around the world, ask the question, why does God allow even his people uh, that he loves and sent his son to die for? Why does God allow us to experience suffering and sorrow, pain and death? And what is his purpose in that? And so he's going to start a conference tonight, uh, but this morning he is going to preach from God's Word. And so please welcome Mr. Justin Peters this morning as he shares God's Word with us. Thank you, brother. Well, good morning. Hope everyone is doing well. Can, everyone, can you all hear me? Okay, you can hear me all right? Okay, all right. Hope everyone's doing well this morning. It is a joy to be with you. It truly is. I've been looking forward to this time. Uh, oh, I guess we've had it scheduled for about a, a year or so, and uh, really very much looking forward to our time together, and I'm grateful for this opportunity, thankful um, that uh, your pastor has opened up his pulpit to me. I think the world of him already, just in having been with him 24 hours or so. So uh, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and then we'll begin. Father, we do thank you for this time that you have provided for us, that we can to gather around as your people who have access to your throne of grace, not through any merit of our own, but through the merits of your Son, Christ, his work for us completed on the cross. We pray that as we go to your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit would do what he and only he can do, that he would uh, open our minds uh, to, and he would illumine the meaning of your word to our hearts, to our minds, and that uh, he would help us to appropriate what we know and live lives of obedience to the glory of Christ our King. These things we ask in His name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to take your copy of God's Word and open to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16. Luke, chapter 16. This is a message I have entitled, Sola Scriptura. Sola Scriptura. Luke, chapter 16. Now, as you're turning there, let me just briefly give you a little bit of um, an idea of where we're headed with the seminar tonight, uh, beginning tonight and, and through the rest of our time together. We'll be talking about what's called the Word of Faith movement, the health and wealth, name it and claim it, prosperity gospel, uh, all of the, the TV preachers that you see, Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, Jesse Duplantis, Joyce Meyer, Joel Osteen. Uh, we'll be talking about the unbiblical nature of this movement. And uh, I will have video clips of all these individuals that you see on Christian television. And we'll be talking about how profoundly unbiblical this movement is. What a, what a terrible distortion of God's Word. What a thoroughly heretical movement it is. What you see on Christian television is not Christian. It is cultic doctrine that has been wrapped in some Christian lingo, some Christian terminology. And so uh, we'll be talking about that and uh, all of how all of this uh, relates to biblical truth, to the sovereignty of God and suffering and sickness, but uh, we'll be dealing with a lot of issues. We'll be covering a lot of ground over the next few nights, so I do invite you to come back uh, beginning tonight. But this morning, we are just going to take a passage of God's Word, and we will uh, do what is called exposition, exposit God's Word, Luke 16, verses 19 through 31. Now, I'll be reading from the... New American Standard, so it might be slightly different from uh, if you have the ESV, a little bit different, but not much. So Luke 16, 19 through 31. Now, there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table, besides even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. 
Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and he saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things, but now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great chasm fixed so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, then they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone were to rise from the dead. May God bless the reading of his word. Now this is not a warm, fuzzy passage of scripture. You're not going to read this about, uh, about this passage in Chicken Soup for the Soul, or you're not, you will never hear Joel Osteen even touch a passage like this. But dear friends, uh, this passage is just as much inspired, just as much authoritative as any other verse in the Word of God. On many levels, this is a disturbing passage. It is a graphic passage. It is jarring to us. But I trust also that we will see as we work our way through this text that this is also a greatly encouraging passage of Scripture for us as well. Now, there is a little bit of debate as to exactly what this is. Some theologians believe that this is a parable that Jesus taught. Others believe that this is a real account, a real event in history. And as we speak right now, the rich man is languishing in the lake of fire and Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom. And there's a little bit of evidence on either side of this. For the parable side, it, it, it seems to fit because this is in the context of other parables that Jesus is teaching and so it would seem to fit very well that this is a parable. However, if it is a parable, it is unlike any of Jesus' other parables because in this account, Jesus gives us specific names. He names Lazarus. He names Abraham. He names Moses. In, is that thunder? In, okay, I didn't even know it was clapping. But in these, sorry, it just kind of threw me off. In, in this account, he, he gives us specific names, and he does not do that in any of his other parables. In none of his other parables does he do that. So um, if it is a parable, it is unlike any of Jesus' other parables. And I think by giving us specific names here, Jesus is driving home to us the stark realities of what happens to someone when he or she dies outside of Christ. These are very graphic things. These are very stark realities and he is driving home to us the importance of making sure you know where you are going before you leave this earth. Now, let me set a little bit of the context here. Flip back probably just one page in your Bible just to set the scene here Look a little bit. Look at chapter 15 and verse 1. This is just to set the scene so we can kind of know what's going on. Chapter 15, verse 1 it says, Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. So you have a large group of people that had gathered around Christ. You have tax collectors, sinners of various kinds, Pharisees, scribes. So a, a, a lot of people had gathered around Christ to listen to him. And then he began to teach in parables. Look at chapter 16, verse 1, though. Chapter 16, verse 1, it says, Now he was also saying to the disciples. And, and when you tease that out a little bit, the sense is, is that he had turned his attention away from the large crowd 
to his disciples. He was no longer addressing the scribes and the Pharisees and the tax collectors and the sinners in general. Now he was just addressing his disciples. He turned his attention away from the crowd and now he's addressing strictly his disciples as chapter 16 verse, uh, verse 1 opens. But look in verse 14 of 16. Chapter 16 verse 14 it says, Now the Pharisees who were lovers of money were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. So even though Jesus had turned his attention away from the large crowd, was addressing now strictly his disciples, notice that the Pharisees never left the scene. They were kind of still there hanging around in the background, eavesdropping, if you will, on what he was saying. So he was no longer addressing them, but they never left the scene. They were still there hanging around in the background. And notice that the Bible says that the Pharisees were lovers of what? Money. They were lovers of money. So with that, let us now go to our primary text, verse 19. It says, Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. The picture here is one of extreme opulence. This rich man was very, very rich. It says he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen. Now, purple was a very difficult color to manufacture 2,000 years ago. Purple was actually derived from the oil of snails. It was a very uh, labor-intensive color to manufacture, very difficult. So if, if you had an entire garment made out of purple, you were a very, very wealthy person. And notice that the text here says, he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen. So uh, not only did he have a, a garment made out of purple, apparently he had a whole wardrobe made out of purple garments and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. Uh, if you had a whole wardrobe full of purple clothes, you had arrived, okay? I mean, this, this man was very, very wealthy, extremely an extremely opulent lifestyle. This was the Bill Gates of the ancient world. He had everything that the world could possibly offer. Everything that the world could offer, he had. Undoubtedly, he had a very nice palatial home. Undoubtedly, he had a, a, a whole stable full of servants and, and uh, probably male and female servants. I mean, he had everything the world could offer, all of the rich food, uh, fancy clothes, everything this guy had. There was nothing else that the world could offer that he didn't have. Very, very wealthy. But look at verse 20. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. The picture here is the exact opposite. The rich man had everything he could possibly want. Lazarus had absolutely nothing. Now the picture here of Lazarus is very, very graphic. Notice that the text says that Lazarus was laid at the rich man's gate. Lazarus didn't walk there on his own. Lazarus was picked up and carried and laid at the rich man's gate. Lazarus could not even move on his own. Lazarus was crippled, diseased, sick, could not even move about on his own. Wherever you laid Lazarus, that's where he was going to be, crippled, could not move on his own. And it says, laid at his gate, covered with sores, open, oozing, undoubtedly infected, diseased, raw, sores and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table Lazarus was starving he was crippled his skin was covered with open diseased sores he was starving longing to just have the crumbs that were falling from the rich man's table Undoubtedly, Lazarus looked like a skeleton with skin draped over it. Very, very graphic. And then, to add insult to injury, 
Notice that the text says, besides even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now when we read dogs in the New Testament, don't think about some happy little cocker spaniel. These were not pets. These were wild dogs. And they were not licking his sores to comfort him. They were licking his sores and were tormenting him. This is a very graphic picture. It is jarring. It is disturbing. And you could not have two more polar opposites. The rich man with everything that the world could offer. Lazarus with absolutely nothing. Crippled, diseased, starving, tormented by wild dogs. It does not get any worse than that. But notice too, we don't know the rich man's name, but we know Lazarus' name. The poor man's name, Lazarus. Now, Lazarus means something. The name Lazarus means God helps. That's what the name Lazarus means, God helps. And I believe that Christ is giving us this name for a very specific reason. Lazarus helps. I mean, God helps. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand and if you think that God helps those who help themselves is in the Bible. It's not. I heard Bill O'Reilly one night a few years ago. He was talking to some Catholic priest, and he said, My favorite Bible verse is God helps those who help themselves. Not only is it not in the Bible, it's not even a biblical concept. Dear friends, God does not help those who help themselves. God helps those who understand they cannot help themselves. And just as helpless as Lazarus was physically, you and I are just that helpless spiritually. Lazarus could do nothing for himself. He was completely at the mercy of others. You and I can do nothing for ourselves Spiritually, we are completely at the mercies of God. The Bible says that all of us are sinners. We have all violated the laws of God and we are spiritually dead. And there is nothing that we can do to help ourselves into the mercies of God. There is nothing that we can do. And you ask most people today, well, when you die, will you go to heaven? And most people think that they will go to heaven if they believe in such a place. They'll say, yes, I believe I'll go to heaven. And you say, well, why? Well, I'm a good person. Most people believe they're good people. And if you were to go out and ask 100 people out there on the street, are you a good person? I guarantee you 99 out of 100 of them would say that they are. Because what we like to do is we like to compare ourselves to other people. And if I were to compare myself to... Osama bin Laden or uh, Jack the Ripper and Pol Pot, Saddam Hussein, hmm, I'm a pretty good old boy. You know, I, I haven't done any of those things. But dear friends, God does not evaluate our goodness by comparing us to other people. He evaluates our goodness by comparing us to himself. And none of us compared to God are good. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glories of God. We have all broken God's laws. And we have broken God's laws thousands and thousands of times. Let's just say you commit five sins a day. And I guarantee you for all of us it's a lot more than that. But let's just say five sins a day. In just a year, you're looking at 1,600 sins. 1,600, you multiply that over 10, 20, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, thousands and thousands upon thousands of times we have broken God's laws. And just like when a criminal breaks laws on earth, there is a penalty to be paid, how much more so when we break the laws of God. But unlike breaking laws on earth that are temporal, when we sin against God, when we break His laws, the penalty of that sin that transgression is eternal because we have sinned against the one who is eternal and there are no amount of good works that we can do to overcome those sins there are no amount of good works and most people think well as long as my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds well God will allow me into heaven dear friends that is a concept that is far into the word of God our works are as filthy rags before a thrice holy God we cannot do anything to help ourselves. We are at the mercies of God. Christ did everything for us. 
if there was something that we could do to earn God's favor, if there was something that we could do to earn our place into heaven, then the cross of Jesus Christ is meaningless. It has no meaning. It has no power. Christ willingly laid down His life on the cross. The God-man who had broken none of God's laws, the spotless Lamb of God, willingly laid down His life on the cross and He bore the wrath of God, the penalty of our sins. What you deserve, what I deserve, He took upon Himself and satisfied God's wrath, died on the cross, bodily raised from the dead on the third day. There is nothing that we can do to help ourselves. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Lazarus could do nothing for himself. You and I can do nothing for ourselves. Look at verse 22. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Dear friends, it does not matter how much we have or how little we have. It does not matter who we know or who knows us. Death will come to us all. Death is the great equalizer. Now, it didn't come as a big surprise when Lazarus died, right? I mean, he was crippled, he was sick, he was diseased, he was starving, he was, he was on death's door, so no surprise there. But apparently, the rich man died about the same time as Lazarus did. Death undoubtedly came as quite the surprise to him because it says he was dressed in fine linen, habitually uh, living in splendor every day. Life was good for him. Death didn't seem close for him. But oh, it was because they apparently died about the same time. Death is an appointment we will all one day meet and we do not know when it is coming. Be prepared. Be prepared. Now, undoubtedly, when the rich man died, he had a very nice funeral. Undoubtedly, when the rich man died, he had a, a nice funeral. There was probably some, some really important people that were there at his funeral service. There was probably some flowery speeches that were made. His body was well cared for. It was wrapped in linen. It was anointed with various perfumes and oils and spices. And undoubtedly, it was then placed in an ornate tomb because only the wealthy could afford tombs in this day and age. But undoubtedly, the rich man had one. So very nice funeral, very fancy funeral. His body was laid in this ornate tomb and sealed. So very nice funeral for the rich man. No such funeral for Lazarus. Lazarus didn't have a nice funeral. There were no fancy speeches made over Lazarus' body. There were no important people there at Lazarus' funeral. Undoubtedly, what happened to Lazarus was the same thing that happened to all of the dead, sick, and poor, diseased people. Undoubtedly, Lazarus' body was picked up, carried outside of the city gates, and dumped in a pile of garbage to be consumed either by fire or by the elements, wild animals. No nice funeral for Lazarus. But notice in the text, look who his pallbearers were. It says he was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. You know, dear ones, I do not lose a great deal of sleep over what kind of funeral I'm going to have one of these days. I don't really care what you do with my body, I won't know it. I'll be in heaven. I don't care what you do with my body. You know, I, I don't care what anybody says about me at my funeral. I really don't. The only thing I would request at my funeral is that the gospel be preached. Other than that, I don't care. But you know what? I want these pallbearers. I want to be carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And I want to hear those words, well done, good and faithful, doulos, slave, well done. And dear friends, the only way to have these pallbearers when you die is to be in Christ Jesus, to have repented of your sins and trusted the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. 
there is salvation in no one else. There is not salvation in your good works. Your good works are filthy rags. There is not salvation in being a church member. You must be in Christ. You must have the new nature, the new birth. And that comes only by turning from sins and placing your trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Trusting His merits. You must have His righteousness. We have no righteousness on our own. None. We must have a righteousness that is alien to us. We must have the righteousness of Christ imputed to us, counted to our accounts. And that happens through repentance and faith in Him. No one else. We want these pallbearers. We want these pallbearers. Look in verse 23. It says, In Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and he saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue for I am in agony in this flame. This would have scandalized the Pharisees. Remember that the Pharisees are lovers of what? Money. And they just assumed that if Someone had money, that was a sure sign of God's favor. What's the rich man doing in the lake of fire? This would have absolutely scandalized them. And many people have that view today. Well, if, if someone is wealthy, that, that is a sure sign of God's favor. If someone is poor and sick and diseased, that's a sure sign of God's displeasure. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. Lazarus died, he went to Abraham's bosom, the rich man died, and he found himself in the lake of fire, Hades, which will one day, when the events of Revelation 21 take place, Hades will become known as hell with a capital H. It's a little bit of a distinction, but not a great deal of difference. They're, they're described in the exact same ways. So this would have scandalized the Pharisees. He woke up, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, he saw Abraham far away, Lazarus in his bosom. Now, dear ones, it would be a mistake to assume that the rich man went to the lake of fire because he was rich and Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom because he was poor. That's not the point of the text. Each man went where he was spiritually prepared to go. Each man went where he was spiritually prepared to go. And look at verse 24. And he cried out and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me Send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. Dear friends, sometimes I wonder, do we really believe what we say we believe happens to people when they die in their sins? You know, as Baptists, we call ourselves people of the book, people of the Bible. Oh, we believe the Bible. Sometimes I wonder. If we really believe what we say we believe about this book, if we really believe what we say we believe about what happens to people if they die in their sin, do we really believe that they go to this place? And if we do, why are we not out in the highways and in the hedges warning people how to escape this place? So many times I've heard hell described as just being eternally separated from God. If you die in your sins, you'll be eternally separated from God, eternally separated from Christ. That's not entirely true. Read Revelation 14, verses 9, 10, and 11. It says, Those who are in the lake of fire, in the place of torment, in hell, it says they will be tormented day and night in the presence of of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Do you know what the most terrifying thing about hell is? Not the absence of God, the presence of God. Because God is there in His mode of wrath. And God's wrath will be poured out on the ungodly day and night forever and ever and ever, and it will never end. The fire will not be quenched. The worm will not die. 
the undiluted fury of God's wrath will be poured out on the wicked forever and ever. Let's not soft pedal hell. Let's not say, oh, if you die in your sins, you'll just be eternally separated from Christ because that's not entirely true. People in hell are separated from Christ relationally. Okay, there's no relationship there. There is no love exchange there between God and the condemned. There, there is no fellowship there. But judicially, judicially, people in hell will be in the presence of God in his mode of wrath for all of eternity. Let's not soft pedal hell. And notice too, this is a condemning verse of scripture for the rich man. Notice what he says. He cried out and he said, Father Abraham. Pause on that just a moment. Father Abraham. This man had the ability to see across this great chasm and notice who he recognized. He said, Father Abraham. He recognized Abraham. Not only did he, he recognize him, he called him by name. He gave him a title of respect, Father Abraham. Dear friends, this was not some atheist. This was a Jew. This was a man who had been taught the scriptures. This was a man who had a head knowledge of the scriptures. He had been taught the word of God. He had head knowledge. He had some theology. He knew of the things of God. He knew the scriptures. What's he doing in hell? Dear friends, I will be the first one, and I champion this everywhere I go, everywhere I preach, everywhere I go, all across the United States, all around the world. I champion this. Study sound doctrine. Study to show yourself approved. Don't just claim the name of Christ. Don't just claim to be a Christian and never study this book. You want to fill your head with the knowledge of Christ. You want the word of Christ to dwell richly within you. And I would be the first to tell you that those people who claim to love Christ and yet they do not read and study this book do not love Christ nearly as much as they profess to love Him. Study to show yourself approved unto God. I champion that everywhere I go. But in your studying, make certain that your head knowledge has penetrated your heart. This man had head knowledge, but that head knowledge had not penetrated his heart. And there will be, as I've heard John MacArthur said, there will be many theologians in hell. Hell will be full of theologians. Hell will be full of people who had a knowledge of the Word of God, an intellect, a, a head knowledge of God's Word, but that knowledge, that head knowledge has not penetrated their hearts. Make sure in your reading and your studying, which is good, make sure that that head knowledge has penetrated your heart. It had not penetrated the heart of the rich man because notice who, he, who else he recognizes. He says, Father Abraham, send Lazarus. Send Lazarus. It's not that the rich man didn't know that Lazarus had been laid at his gate. Oh, he knew it. Not only did he know it, he even knew Lazarus' name. Send Lazarus. But even now, even now, Lazarus is nothing more than his errand boy. Send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue. For I'm in agony in this flame. No apologies from the rich man to Lazarus. No crying out to Lazarus and Lazarus, I'm sorry. No, the fires of hell do not bring repentance. They just sear one's conscience even further and people in hell hate God in hell more than they even did on earth. He knew Lazarus was there, even knew his name, but he would not lift a finger to help him. But now the rich man wants Lazarus to lift his finger, dip it in water to help him. Has your head knowledge penetrated your heart? Has there been a change in your life since you've professed Christ? And dear friends, there are two different kinds of sorrow over sin. And this is something that I wish I heard preached more often that unfortunately we rarely do. There's two different kinds of sorrow over sin. And all of us have one of these two different kinds of sorrow. 
Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. There is a worldly sorrow that leads to death, and there is a godly sorrow that leads to repentance unto salvation. All of us fall in one of those two camps. What is a worldly sorrow? A worldly sorrow is nothing more than what the rich man had. A worldly sorrow is nothing more than a guilty conscience. What would happen to me if my sin were exposed? What would be the consequences to me? And so we try to cover up our sin because we don't want the consequences of those sins. Not that we grieve over them, we just don't want to be caught. We just don't want the consequences of our sins. And so we cover up our sins so there be no consequences to us. What would happen to me if my sin were found out? If everybody knew what was going on in my life, if my sin were exposed, what would be the consequences to me? That's a worldly sorrow. And Paul says a worldly sorrow leads to death, eternal death. But there's another kind of sorrow over sin. And the other kind of sorrow over sin is a godly sorrow. A godly sorrow, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, chapter 7, leads to repentance unto salvation. What is a godly sorrow over sin? A godly sorrow over sin is that sorrow that is vertically oriented. A godly sorrow over sin is the sorrow that we have when we grieve over our sins. And we grieve over our sins because we understand that our sin is first and foremost against God. And we grieve over them because we do not want to grieve God. A godly sorrow over sin is the sorrow that David had in Psalm chapter 51. Remember, David had committed horrific sins of adultery and murder. And then his friend Nathan came to him, confronted him, and he said, You are the man. And David was broken over his sins. And David cried out and he said, Against you and you alone, O Lord, have I sinned. A godly sorrow over sin is that grieving over sin. When we grieve over our sin because we understand that our sin is first and foremost against God and we do not want to grieve Him, we do not want to grieve His person. That is a godly sorrow over sin that leads to repentance unto salvation. A godly sorrow over sin is one of the hallmarks of a regenerated heart. And dear friends, just as much as we should want a Savior from hell, and we should, it is good and it is right to warn people of the wrath to come, judgment to come, absolutely. But just as much as we should want a Savior from hell, we should want a Savior from our sin. If you want a Savior from hell but do not want a Savior from sin, then you have a Savior from neither. And it's not that a Christian cannot sin. A Christian can and does sin. But a Christian does not swim in sin. A Christian does not enjoy sin. A Christian does not look for opportunities to sin. A Christian may stumble into sin, but he does not swim in it. And when we as believers sin, in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That was written to believers. That was written to Christians. That was not primarily an evangelistic passage, even though we've used it that way most of the time. That was written to believers. So yes, we can sin, but we don't swim in it. We stumble into it, but we do not swim in it. We do not look for opportunities to sin. When we do sin, it grieves us, and we desire to repent, turn from that sin, because we do not want to grieve Christ. Do you have a worldly sorrow over your sin or a godly sorrow? Do you try to cover up your sin because you don't want the consequences of it? But if you could get away with it, you'd go right back to it. That's a worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow comes when we grieve over our sin. And just as much as we should want a Savior from hell, we should want a Savior from our sin. That's a godly sorrow. Do you have a godly sorrow? Has there been a change in your life? Do you have a love for the Lord? Do you have a love for His Word? Do you have a desire to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you have a love for the brethren? These are all hallmarks, fruits of regeneration. The rich man did not have that. Verse 25. But Abraham said, Child, 
Remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. The great reversal. Death is the great equalizer. It comes to us all no matter how much or how little we have. And here we see the great reversal. On earth the rich man had everything that the world could offer. Lazarus had nothing. Now everything is reversed. The rich man languishing in the lake of fire, Lazarus being comforted in Abraham's bosom, a euphemism for heaven. And look at verse 26. It says, and besides all this, between us and you there is a great chasm fixed so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able and that none may cross over from there to us. Dear friends, when death comes for us, all of us will go to one of two places and we will be there for all of eternity. There are no second chances. Wherever you are prepared to go when this life is over, that is where you will be for all of eternity. No second chances. There is no such thing as purgatory. That is a figment that the Roman Catholic Church has created out of thin air. It does not exist. There is a great chasm and it is fixed. No going back. No second chances. Settle that now. Verse 27. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Finally, the rich man is thinking about somebody besides himself. Finally. Send Lazarus to my five brothers. Finally, thinking about somebody besides himself, but it's far too little and it's far too late. And notice, yet again, Lazarus is nothing more than his errand boy. Send Lazarus. Now, you read between the lines here a little bit. When the rich man says to Abraham, send Lazarus to my five brothers so that he can warn them so that they will not also come to this place. Apparently, had Lazarus done that, the five brothers would have recognized Lazarus too. So apparently the five brothers knew who Lazarus was as well, so it's not looking real good for the brothers either. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. What a surprising statement. Abraham responds to him. He says, Your brothers, they don't need Lazarus. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Moses and the prophets. Moses and the prophets had been dead for centuries. How could they possibly hear Moses and the prophets? This is how. This is how they hear Moses and the prophets. Through the scriptures. They have Moses and the prophets. They have the word of God. Let them hear them. But the rich man said, No, Father Abraham, that's not enough. No, Father Abraham, but if somebody were to just come back from the dead, then they'll believe. If they could just see Lazarus back from the dead, that'll make them believe. The written word of God won't do it, but a miracle will. What did Abraham say? If they will not hear Moses, if they will not hear the prophets, neither will they believe, even if somebody were to rise from the dead. Dear friends, there is an inherent power in this book that is not found anywhere else. Not in miracles, not in signs and wonders. And yet we have a whole swath of Christianity out there, and I should say quote unquote Christianity out there because it's not really Christianity. But we have a whole swath of people out there who call themselves Christians, claim the name of Christ, and their entire emphasis is on miracles and signs and wonders. And this is what we'll be looking at a lot in the next few days. And they say, oh, the, the power of God is in miracles. The power of God is in signs and wonders. And you have this all over the place. It is the face of Christianity around the world today. And we, we, in the Word of Faith movement, in the New Apostolic Reformation movement, you know, we've got guys out there, of course, like Benny Hinn claiming to do signs and wonders. He doesn't do signs and wonders. We've got Bill Johnson out there in Redding, California, uh, pastor of Bethel Church. And their whole emphasis is on signs and wonders. And they, they claim all these things happen in their church services. They claim angel feathers fall out of the sky. 
They claim that gold dust appears and it gets on people. It's all over their clothes and it's in their Bibles and it's all over everything. There's gold dust and you can go on YouTube and you can look at this. There's actually video of this gold, gold dust. They call it the glory cloud. And it's gold dust that gets on people. Ooh, it's, that's, the, that's the power of God. It's not the power of God. That's a parlor trick. I actually talked with a lady year and a half ago who used to be in one of these churches actually um, El Rey Jesus uh, kind of Bill Johnson's counterpart pastored by a guy named Guillermo Maldonado in Miami Florida uh, Bill Johnson and Guillermo Maldonado are friends and this lady came to my conference she told me she used to be a member of Maldonado's church she said I used to be high up in it her husband sadly still is and she said but Justin when I was there she said it was actually my job I was given canisters of finely ground stationary glitter, gold stationary glitter. And we were told, seeing a friend of hers, she said it was our job to go up into the ventilation system and dump this stuff in the ventilation system and it would blow out on everybody in the congregation. And they were being, the people were being told that's the power of God. That's a, that's a lie parlor tree. It's deception. Dear friends, the power of God is not in these so-called miracles and signs and wonders. That's not the power of God. And Abraham says, even if someone were to come back from the dead, they will not believe. If they will not hear Moses, if they will not hear the prophets, in other words, if they will not respond to the word of God, Neither will they believe, even if somebody were to come back from the dead. And then we have this whole other swath of professing Christianity out there, the more the seeker-sensitive kind of stuff. And dear friends, this stuff, well, both the signs and wonders and the seeker-sensitive, but the seeker-sensitive really is infecting our circles, more Baptist circles. And you have all these churches out there that want to make church fun. They want to make church entertaining. And, and they're going to bring in the elements of the world. And they're, they're going to they're make church look like the world. They're going to make church look fun and entertaining. And they'll have the strobe lights and the smoke machines and all the fancy bells and whistles. And they'll bring in worldly music. And the pastor will look like he just walked out of a Forever 21 store. And you get up and you give a little talk. But in this talk, he won't, he won't talk much about sin. Won't talk much about repentance. Everything will be diluted down. Oh, there'll be some of the lingo there. You know, you'll have a, a, a verse here and there, cherry-picked. And, you know, you'll have some sermon about how to, how to have good relationships or how to, you know, all this kind of nonsense. But it's all just topical preaching. And, and they're, they're not going to talk much about doctrine. They're going to dilute the gospel. A little veneer of, of Christianity, yeah, but they're, but they're going to dilute things. They're not going to talk about sin much because they don't want to make people uncomfortable. You've got to attract people. You've got to make church fun and entertaining and attract the world. And to keep worldly people, you're going to have to give them worldly messages. You're not going to talk much about taking up the cross of genuine repentance, brokenness, sound doctrine, because that will drive them away. And these pastors... They'll get up and they'll tell you, oh, we believe the Bible is the Word of God. No, you don't. No, you don't. Oh, we believe the Bible is authoritative. No, you don't. Because I can tell by how you preach and how you do church that you don't really believe it. Because if you really believed it, you would be preaching the Word of God verse by verse, so you would be expositing the, God, the Word of God. You wouldn't be watering anything down. Paul says in Romans 1, verse 16, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation for the Jew first and also to the Greek for everyone who believes for the Jew first and also to the Greek what is the power of God the gospel is the gospel this is the power of God unto salvation there is an inherent power in this book dear ones that is found nowhere else not in miracles not in signs and wonders not in secret sensitive churches, not in making church fun, not in all these goofy movies that come out. 
you know, these, all these Christian movies, and, and there's one or two of them that are okay, but most of them are just garbage. But, it, you know, it seems like every, every year or so, some new fad comes down the evangelical pike, and we're going to get all excited about this new fad. But that's all they are, is fads, and they fade. How many of you remember Prayer of Jabez? Remember that? Doing it anymore? No. It's a fad. Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson's movie. That was going to be the most powerful evangelistic tool of all time, I heard people say. Dear friends, I would submit to you this book is the most powerful evangelistic tool of all time. You want to see the power of God unleashed? Take this book out into the highways and the hedges. Preach the gospel. Teach sound doctrine. A few years ago, I was on a, uh, an airplane. I guess just about every preacher has an airplane story. And I travel a lot, so I've got a number of them, but one kind of stands out. Several years ago, I was on a plane. It was an overseas trip, large plane, and um, they always let me pre-board because of my crutches. You know, it takes me longer to get on. So, so uh, I'm usually, if not the first one, one of the first ones on the plane. And so um, my seat on this particular flight was all the way in the back, very back seat. And um, so I sat down and the stewardess took my crutches and, you know, put them up and overhead or whatever, and I sat down. And uh, right as I sat down, then the other passengers start coming on the flight. And I just kind of was, you know, just looked up the aisle, and I could see way down the aisle on the other end of the plane as their passengers are coming on, I saw this old man. Uh, he was, had a cane, old man. And I happened to notice he was wearing a baseball cap, navy blue baseball cap, and on the front of the cap, I could see WWII veteran, World War II veteran. And I've always had an interest in history, and, and uh, so I, I saw this old man coming down the aisle, and I just said a quick prayer. I said, Lord, let him sit next to me. And wouldn't you know it, he came all the way down that aisle, and he sat right next to me. And uh, I kind of let him get his stuff, you know, situated and settled and whatnot. And, and um, so after he did that, I introduced myself to him. I, I said, my name is Justin. I said, what's your name? And he said, my name's Fred. And I said, well, hi, Mr. Fred. I said, it's nice to meet you. And he said, nice to meet you. So, you know, we made some small talk, you know, like where we were going, who we were going to see and whatnot. And um, I said, Mr. Fred, I see from your hat you're a World War II veteran. He said, yes, I am. And I said, well, what theater were you in? My, I told him my grandfather was in the European theater and he was as well. And so we got to talking about that, and he ended up telling me some of the things that happened to him in World War II. He was in combat. And he told me about being in battles and in, in trenches, literally hearing the, the bullets zing over his head and explosions going off and the tanks and, and all of that that he experienced. And he was telling me some of these stories. And after a while, I said, of course, I thanked him for his service, and I said, Mr. Fred, I, I bet it probably made you think what would have happened to you if one of those bullets had had your name on it. And he said, he said, I have thought about that. And I said, well, Mr. Fred, death will come to all of us one of these days. I said, when it comes your time, do you know where you're going to go? And he said, no, Justin, I don't. And I said, well, Mr. Fred, can I share with you what the Bible has to say about that? And do you know what he said to me? I'll never forget it. He said, I wish you would. And so I just began sharing the gospel with Fred. And I told him about how we are all sinners. We have broken God's laws. God is holy. He is just. He must punish sin. If he did not punish sin, he would not be good just like a judge who did not punish crime would not be a good judge. And I told Mr. Fred how God is the ultimate good judge. And I said, Mr. Fred, if we die in our sins, we'll very rightly and very justly go to a very real place that the Bible calls hell. I said, but there is good news. 
in the good news of the gospel is that God loves you. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect, sinless life on this earth, never broke any of God's laws, willingly laid down His life on the cross. He bore the wrath of God so that we would not have to. Died on the cross, bodily raised from the dead on the third day. And I told him, I said, Fred, our works can't save us. We must have the righteousness of Christ. I said, if you'll turn from your sins, if you'll repent of sins and place your trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross, He will save you. He will save you. And you can know where you'll go when you die. And he asked me a couple of questions about it, and I explained to him, and so we had just a, a wonderful conversation about the gospel, and he was interested. I could tell him, and he wanted to know. And at the end of it, he said, Justin, I have, he said, I want to thank you for sharing that with me. He said, I've never heard that before. This man, right at 90 years old, living in the United States of America, never heard the gospel. He said, I want to thank you. And then the lady in the seat in front of me, she kind of did her head back like this, and she said, and I want to thank you too. I was listening to every word you said. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also to the Greek. What is the power of God? The gospel. We hold in our hands the most powerful evangelistic tool of all time. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, recorded in Scripture alone. This, dear ones, is the power of God. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word that you have preserved for us. We thank you that it is all sufficient for everything that we need. We thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit who convicts us of the truth of what is in your word and changes our hearts, softens our hearts to the truth of the gospel. And I, Father, I pray that you would do that even now. I pray that your Holy Spirit would do that work that only he can do. And for all of us who are believers, Father, may we be encouraged, may we be strengthened by the confidence that we have in our hands a copy of the most powerful evangelistic tool of all time. We have in our hands the revelation of yourself to us. May we study it to show ourselves approved. May we live out what we know. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.